fluffy pancakes, sunny side eggs, crispy bacon, golden hash browns with buttered toast and coffee is a meal as American as guns, tipping, and ice water. While you can easily whip up these foods at home, it just hits different when you're at a diner, when you're sitting on tall vinyl stools, immersed in old school decor, serviced by waitresses that move as fast as they talk, and watching the griddle cooks work their magic behind the counter. For decades, diners have specialized in serving not just the hearty American breakfast, but also classics like burgers, waffles, milkshakes, soup, and pie. Thanks to their sustained popularity through generations and their continuous depiction in television and film, diners have become so ingrained into American culture that they're iconic establishments all around the world. While every industry is under constant pressure to evolve, diners are the rare example of a business that has been invincible to change. While the restaurant industry has gravitated towards fast casual, off-premise dining, small menus, originality, and automation, diners have remained consistent since the 1940s. Huge menus, open 24-7 or into the late night, traditional human service with pen and paper, simple comfort foods, and a basic non-judgmental atmosphere. For diners, customers aren't looking for reinvention or modernization. When people go to a diner, they're not expecting award-winning Canadian maple syrup, hand-cut potatoes, organic eggs, artisan bread, European butter, third-wave coffee, and house-made vinaigrettes. Instead, what people crave are the tried-and-true, nostalgic, basic flavors, processed craft singles, store-bought bread, spreadable fake butter made from vegetable oil, frozen hash browns, steamed vegetables, pre-mixed salads, Thousand Island from the bottle, and Quaker oats from the packet. Through history, diners have built their reputation as an establishment for families and the working class. This value prop has remained unchanged decades later, as even modern customers continue to value diners for their predictability, reliability, consistency, and modestness. Drunk college students who come in late at night will leave just as satisfied as the blue-collar workers who come in after their shifts or for the families that are making pit stops on their road trips. At a diner, there are no reservations, no VIPs, no private seating arrangements, no policies, no minimums, and no judgment. Everyone is accepted and treated the same. In this episode, we'll cover the invincible business of the American diner and analyze the three biggest chains in the world, Denny's, Cracker Barrel, and IHOP, who each have their own strategy and go after customers in very different ways. This episode is sponsored by Domain Money, a fast-growing fintech startup that's revolutionizing personal finance. As I moved up the ladder in corporate America, it became harder to stay on top of my money with greater work demands and life responsibilities. I was suddenly expected to magically figure it all out like everyone else, like where to get the highest yield savings accounts, how to maximize credit, how to set up a Roth IRA, and how much to contribute to my 401k. I was constantly running back between my accountants, HR, Google, and the banks trying to piece together who to trust and what I should do. I could never afford a financial advisor and the ones everyone wanted cost thousands of dollars per year and only served millionaires. Enter Domain Money. Domain Money gives you your own dedicated financial advisor for just $79 a month with no hidden fees or investment minimums. Your dedicated domain financial advisor manages your personal finances by helping you set up the right savings accounts, investments, and optimizes your insurance and will even prepare and file your taxes for you. Your dedicated advisor is available to chat whenever via text, video, or call. And with a simple login to Domain Money's website or mobile app, you can view your net worth, monthly cash flow, investments, and credit card transactions all in one place. Domain advisors are certified financial planner professionals, the highest standard in financial services, and are legally responsible as fiduciaries to giving you the best investment advice. They're there to answer your questions anytime, from insurance recommendations to figuring out how to get the most out of your credit card points. As a creator, what I appreciate the most about domain money is their transparency. Unlike most fintech startups, they don't hide. They put their faces and names out there publicly, from the financial advisors to the VPs, so everyone and anyone can openly see their qualifications and track record. Domain Money is a team of ex-Goldman Sachs leaders who saw a better way to help everyday people access financial services. Use my link to skip the waitlist and to try Domain risk-free for 30 days to see how you can build wealth better today. Thank you to Domain Money for supporting Modern MBA and making this episode possible. Diners are unique in that they don't compete on the conventional measures of exceptionalism and originality 
where restaurants typically live or die by either having the most creative or best food in their category. While there are certainly diners who will claim that they have the best pancakes in town, these are marketing measures that are designed more to differentiate themselves from other local diners rather than other restaurants. As businesses, diners orient towards value and breadth. The large menus pull customers in with something for everyone, while the low prices encourage frequent visits and maintain expectations. Since customers don't walk into diners expecting beef wellington, organic lettuce, or even real butter, Diners can make profits with lower prices and bigger menus through sourcing cheap, low-quality processed ingredients. Instead of buying fresh beef or produce, diners can get by with cases of frozen, pre-made burger patties, meatballs, liquid eggs, vegetables, desserts, and even soup by the tub. Ingredients that can be stored for long periods and can be quickly cooked on a flat top, dropped into a fryer, or thrown into an oven for a fraction of the time and cost. While independent restaurants would be shamed for using such shortcuts, diners operate on a different spectrum where the expectations of cheap, simple, comfort foods enables the open and widespread use of such ingredients. While most restaurants center on protein as their draw, diners position carbohydrates as the star of the show. Diners generously pile on carbs in order to cheaply satiate customers and to net high margins despite selling at low prices. Whenever protein prices go up, restaurants must adjust their costs by passing on that bill to customers. With diners, the strategic carb-centric design and the substantial operational simplification insulates them from commodity swings that ordinary restaurants would not be able to avoid. With its iconic red and yellow sign, Denny's is the oldest diner chain in the world. Known as America's Diner, Denny's signature product is the Grand Slam, where for around $10, you can get half of your daily caloric intake on a single plate of two eggs, two pieces of bacon, two pancakes, and two sausage links any time of the day. Most Denny's locations are open 24-7 with breakfast served all day and a quote come-as-you-are atmosphere that's accepting of families, couples, seniors, rowdy students, and late-night drunks. There are over 1,600 Denny's locations worldwide, of which 90% were in the United States. To put this number in perspective, we can compare Denny's to other leading US-based full-service and fast casual chains. Denny's scale is greater than that of conventional full-service restaurants like the Cheesecake Factory and Olive Garden, but lower than fast casual chains like Panera and Chipotle. The average Denny's is a freestanding 4,400 square foot building that supports a seating capacity of 140 guests. In terms of space, a Denny's is twice the size of Chipotle, but not quite as spacious as a steakhouse or a conventional full-service restaurant. Over 96% of Denny's are franchised, which explains why their prices vary so widely from location to location. But what's most interesting is Denny's relationship with its franchisees. As we've covered in the Burger King and the KFC episode, the relationship between a franchisor and its franchisees is typically contentious. Franchisees are the ones running the restaurants day to day, footing the bill, serving the food, and managing the staff, so they can easily feel disgruntled when they feel like their franchisor isn't supporting them. Unsupportive franchisors can come in two forms. One is that they're out of touch slumlords who make little contributions, they sit in ivory towers, and they count their cash from the royalties with no skin in the game. The other form is franchisors who do too much. They're seen as uptight micromanagers who care too much about the day-to-day -day affairs when they really should be focused on the big picture. On the other hand, the franchisor can easily perceive its franchisees as mercenaries who will opportunistically cut corners, step out of line, deviate from established standards, and jeopardize the overall brand in order to squeeze a buck for themselves. When you add in the contrasting incentives where franchisers make money from the top line and franchisees make their money from the bottom line, it's no surprise that these relationships are generally so fragile and strained. Denny's is a refreshing outlier in that the company has proactively sought a positive relationship with its franchisees for decades. Every franchisee gets to join the Denny's Franchisee Association, and the DFA is more than just a suggestion box or group therapy. There are five formal committees, each dedicated to a single part of Denny's business in development, marketing, operations, supply chain, and technology. Franchisees directly collaborate with corporate leadership on all five aspects with the goal of maximizing earnings for both parties. This two-way feedback channel and open partnership is rare. In the case of Burger King or KFC, similar associations exist, but they're more like self-organized groups that don't have official recognition from corporate and boil down more to knowledge sharing and networking opportunities between franchisees as peers.
In the US, Denny's is a name brand, and the strategy behind the diner has been the same since the 2010s. Reinvigoration is the name of the game. The company's goal has been to drive sales beyond breakfast and to remind customers that they don't need to go to fast food exclusively to get cheap, hot meals. To Denny's, they see their primary competition as fast food, and not the traditional mom-and-pop diners, bougie Instagram brunch spots, and other corporate diner chains. For example, it was only when McDonald's rolled out all-day breakfast in 2015 that Denny's decided to replace the water in its powdered pancake mix with real eggs and buttermilk. While Denny's promoted that the finished product was now 50% fluffier, the company had made no effort to improve its pancakes until McDonald's jumped into the breakfast scene. And despite rising food costs, Denny's value menu remains a focal point of the company as an answer to fast food's low prices. While breakfast remains the most popular section on the menu, Denny's has proactively revamped its lunch and dinner offerings over the years with spaghetti, lasagna, milkshakes, skillets, and burgers. Coffee was improved while salmon, whole grain rice, and oven roasted vegetables were all introduced to drive more credibility to Denny's as a diner that serves more than just breakfast. In the early 2010s, the average Denny's building was over 20 years old and clearly showing its age, resembling a cheap cafeteria more than a family-friendly diner. Once again, the company proactively rolled out renovations to update its atmosphere with new floors, walls, colors, tabletops, and roofing. While remodeling might seem like an ordinary investment, this topic will come up again later when we cover IHOP, who chose a very different strategy when it came to keeping up appearances. Since most locations are open 24-7, Denny's closely tracks when a sale occurs. For the past 10 years, 61% of all food and beverage sold and consumed at Denny's happens between breakfast and lunch. The remaining 39% of sales happens at dinner and in the late night. This nighttime business serving night owls, drunk students, and graveyard shift workers contributes 17% of Denny's sales every year. The company has opened up locations not just in new markets, but also non-traditional venues like college campuses and military bases, yet overall expansion has remained slow. The number of Denny's grew from 1,685 in 2011 to 1,735 before COVID and has dwindled back down to roughly 1,600 in 2022. Denny's franchisees pay an initial fee of $30,000, a royalty up to 4.5% of gross sales, and must contribute up to another 3.25% of their gross sales to fund advertising. With a franchise-heavy business, one might expect Denny's profit margins to be in the 20-30% to range. Yet Denny's overall operating margin on average is just 13%, which is on par with chains that own and operate their own restaurants like Chipotle and BJ's Brewhouse. Denny's top line has been declining year over year, but it's not accurate to say that this is due to less people eating at Denny's. The company's revenue on Closer Look is made up of two income streams. One is food and drink sales at corporate-run restaurants, and the other is royalties. As Denny's has run fewer and fewer restaurants, it's expected that the income from food and drink sales will go down while royalties go up, but royalties themselves haven't grown significantly in 10 years. Despite the proactive investment, Annual sales for the average Denny's franchise hasn't grown significantly, just 2% year-over-year when we exclude COVID. The average Denny's franchise grossed $1.3 million in 2010 and reached $1.7 million a year in 2022. The average corporate-owned and operated Denny's experienced stronger growth, going from $1.8 million to nearly $3 million by 2022. The probable explanation for this is that these remaining corporate restaurants are likely some of the highest performing Denny's that enjoy location and demand so strong that corporate isn't willing to give up their cash flow. If we exclude the variable of ownership by blending in location types, the average Denny's went from grossing $1.6 million a year in 2011 to $2.3 million in 2022. This 46% sales growth across 11 years boils down to 3-4% to annual growth. In 2019, a Denny's guest spent on average $10.89 per visit, not including tax and tip, which is well below the average per guest spend at conventional full-service restaurants like the Olive Garden, the Cheesecake Factory, and BJ's Brewhouse. While the margins for diners might be high, the check sizes are also so low that the actual profit captured is small from a dollar perspective. This slow growth has not been lost on franchisees, as Denny's has started recently leaning more into virtual brands to squeeze out more sales during the slower dinner and late-night shifts. 
The Burger Den and the Meltdown are just pre-existing Denny's menu items that have been renamed and are sold to ignorant customers on delivery apps. When we step into the shoes of a Denny's manager, we find that the greatest cost is labor, as a single Denny's is run by 50 people across two shifts. Despite theoretically lower labor costs with tipped front-of-house positions, labor has accounted for 39% on average of a Denny's sales in the past decade. Food costs represent 25%, which is less than compared to other full-service restaurants. As mentioned earlier, franchisees are required to give another 3% of their gross sales to fund advertising. These contributions give the company an annual $70 to $80 million use-it-or-lose-it war chest to target seniors, millennials, and increasingly Hispanics, Denny's fastest-growing demographic. For every $1 spent on advertising, Denny's generates $47 in sales. For Denny's, the diner business is solid, not spectacular, but invincible nonetheless. Cracker Barrel is the youngest and highest grossing diner chain whose earnings are seven times that of Denny's. At Cracker Barrel, you can get breakfast any time of the day, like eggs, pancakes, grits, biscuits and gravy, alongside southern classics like fried chicken, chicken pot pie, meatloaf, country fried steak, and chicken and dumplings, all at affordable prices. The average spend per guest at Cracker Barrel is comparable to that of Denny's. Cracker Barrel is so old school that the company has rejected franchising since its founding, under the belief that good food and good service can only be maintained through control. Without franchising, Cracker Barrel's scale and rate of expansion is smaller and lower than that of Denny's, with only 664 restaurants and having opened only 69 new stores in 12 years. Cracker Barrels are concentrated in the south and in the east, with 80% of locations strategically stationed alongside highways to attract road warriors and traveling families. In the past decade, 39% of transactions occur at lunch between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m., 25% of sales happen at breakfast, and the remaining 37% at dinner, as Cracker Barrel is not open 24-7. Cracker Barrel has two twists compared to the average American diner. One is that they serve beer and wine, and as we covered in the Steakhouse video, alcohol is critical to driving higher spend and profits across all categories. Cracker Barrel is not just a full-service restaurant, but also a retail shop where you can buy distinctive candy, apparel, home goods, seasonal merchandise, and rare novelties. The average Cracker Barrel clocks in at 8,900 square feet, of which 1,900 is dedicated to the retail shop and overall supports a seating capacity of 170 guests. Customers can't miss the opportunity to browse the merchandise as the waiting area, entrance, and exit for the restaurant is through the retail shop. Retail is a $700 million business and contributes on average 20% of the company's annual revenue. With gross margins of 50% on merchandise and shared staffing across the shop and the restaurant, the retail business is a high-margin supplement to Cracker Barrel's low-margin restaurant business. The company's total revenue across retail and restaurant grew from $2.4 billion in 2010 to $3.2 billion by 2022, but the emphasis on quality and affordability also come at the cost of profits. Cracker Barrel built its reputation through the decades with authentic country food and quality service. To its leadership, taking shortcuts would only dilute the established standards, culture, and brand. The company spares no expense when it comes to service and product, cooking with fresh ingredients, and employing over 100 employees across two shifts every day in every location. The use of fresh ingredients makes Cracker Barrel more susceptible to price changes in protein and dairy. While labor was just 39% of sales for a Denny's in 2022, labor cost 45% of sales for the average Cracker Barrel. Cracker Barrel spend on food and labor as a percentage of sales is higher relative to not just Denny's, but also other full-service restaurants. Yet these investments in labor and product are clearly productive as the average Cracker Barrel location grosses much higher earnings than its competition. In 2022, the average Cracker Barrel grossed nearly $5 million in retail and restaurant sales, which is twice as much as Denny's and on par with the posh Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. If we look exclusively at Cracker Barrel's restaurant business for a true apples-to-apples -apples comparison, the average Cracker Barrel grossed nearly $4 million in food and drink in 2022, which is still ahead of Texas Roadhouse, Denny's, and Outback. Despite the clear, above-average emphasis on quality, 
Cracker Barrel has experienced the same slow resilient growth in sales year over year from 2010 to 2019 with an average annual growth rate of just 2.9%. Cracker Barrel and Denny's store level operating margins are identical at 13%. For Denny's, the survivorship bias of their high performing corporate locations inflate their true fundamentals, whereas Cracker Barrel's high margin retail business lifts up their unreported low margin restaurant business. While Denny's earns one-seventh the revenue of Cracker Barrel, Denny's operating margins are far more stable with its franchise business model. Cracker Barrel's operating margins are a lot more volatile, which dips to single digits in rough years and then back to double digits in good years. Cracker Barrel is a dinosaur with its slow-moving, old-fashioned approach to business, which is a refreshing contrast to other small-cap public companies that are always so desperate to show off to Wall Street just how cutting-edge and innovative they can be. Rather than monologues about strategy and flashy product launches, Cracker Barrel executives highlight their uneventful, lumbering, old-school progress every year to analysts. They talk about wins like consolidating the breakfast menu and dinner menu into one handout so customers don't get confused when they're presented with two menus when they first sit down, and training staff not to hand checks early to guests at dinner so they don't feel rushed. Since most Cracker Barrels are located by highways, the company's primary advertising channel to this day remains the old-school billboard, cable television, and radio. As a newer diner entrant with only 40 years of history compared to Denny's 70, Cracker Barrel outspends Denny's on advertising with an annual budget of $90 million. On a per-location basis, Cracker Barrel spends over $100,000 a year on advertising, which is twice as much as Denny's. And from an efficiency standpoint, each $1 that Cracker Barrel spends on advertising generates roughly $36 in sales. IHOP, which stands for the International House of Pancakes, is the world's largest diner chain. IHOP helped normalize eating dessert for breakfast in America, with heart-stopping inventions served all day, like the cheesecake stuffed pancakes, the cinnamon roll-filled pancakes that are topped with cream cheese icing, and cupcake pancakes that are smeared with cake frosting. There are over 1,700 IHOPs around the world, all of which are run by third-party franchisees or licensed operators. The average IHOP sits at 5,000 square feet, features an iconic blue roof, and supports a seating capacity of 170 guests. Like Denny's, most IHOP locations are open 24-7. Dine Brands is the corporation behind IHOP, who also owns Applebee's. While most franchisers would gladly avoid conflict to ensure better long-term outcomes, Dine Brands is the exact opposite as a soulless public corporation with an unapologetic focus on maximizing its own profits. Without any corporate-run locations, Dine Brands extracts revenue from IHOP franchisees in three ways. A standard 4% royalty on gross sales, a markup on proprietary pancake mix that franchisees are required to purchase and use, and a markup on rent for buildings that it leases to franchisees. Since the late 2000s, Dine Brands has opted to do less, leaving it up to each franchisee to figure out financing and location all on their own. While Denny's provides assistance and guidance with site selection, Dine Brands offers no resources for operators. It's up to you to find a suitable spot to open an IHOP in, and even though you won't get any help or advice along the way, you still need to get final approval on your location from Dine Brands before you can start building. There are no payment options for equipment, land, and material. Everything must be paid upfront in full if you want to open an IHOP. On top of the 4% royalty, pancake mix markup, and rent markup, IHOP franchisees must also pay an additional 3.5% of their gross sales to fund advertising. IHOP developments were rare as a majority of the investor attention and company resources went towards saving Applebee's. In a time where Denny's and Cracker Barrel were both investing to broaden their appeal, IHOP remained stagnant and unwaveringly focused on pancakes. Dine brands believe that the constant advertising and cheap limited-time pancake offerings would be enough to keep the brand relevant. Quote, IHOP is top of mind for guests for breakfast and enjoys clear leadership. Most importantly, breakfast also enjoys the lowest food costs, between 400 and 600 basis points, which make the unit economics for IHOP restaurants a compelling proposition. It's about pancakes all the time. Even though we sell other items, pancakes represent who we are. Everyone loves pancakes. They're warm, they're comforting, they're inviting just like our restaurants. And in today's divisive society, we believe that we offer a truly differentiated experience and one that's more sought after than ever before. We offer a place for people to pancake together.
It's hard not to cringe a little at not only the dead serious framing of IHOP as some wholly bipartisan frontier, but also the conversion of the word pancake into a verb to an audience full of Wall Street analysts. From Dinebrand's ivory tower, everything at IHOP is good. Food and drink sales have increased 30% from $2.5 billion to $3.3 billion. Dine Brands has been raking in nearly $200 million every year in royalties, pancake mix, and rent with almost no effort. This revenue from IHOP franchisees has grown consistently at 4% on average for the past 12 years. And as the franchiser, Dine Brands has been enjoying over 80% gross margins every year on IHOP as a business division. The company got so complacent that they even stopped reporting basic IHOP data and their last mention of average check per guest was in 2015 at $11.53. Yet when we look at the numbers on a per-location basis, we see a much harsher reality. The average IHOP grossed just $1.9 million in 2022, and while Dine Brands was raking in 4% annual growth in fees every year, the average IHOP had really only grown its sales 9% in a total of 12 years. With the most franchises and the highest contribution rates, it should be no surprise that IHOP has the largest advertising budget with over $100 million spent every year. But the high spend hasn't translated to necessarily better results as every $1 spent on advertising generates roughly $29 of sales for IHOP. It was only when sales regressed in 2017 when Dine Brands finally reacted, investing in renovations and launching new products that weren't pancakes, like steak burgers, chicken sandwiches, and grilled melts. These days, IHOP is pounding the importance of broadening appeal beyond breakfast, nearly eight years after Denny's and Cracker Barrel had made their own improvements. And just like Denny's, IHOP has staked its growth on virtual brands that can help drive dinner and late night sales by selling the same products with different names to customers on delivery apps. Compared to the competition, Dine Brands was extremely hands-off with IHOP to the point of complacency and neglect, and yet the diner was able to squeeze out positive sales just about every year on its own, even with outdated decor and unremarkable product. As seen with Denny's, IHOP, and Cracker Barrel, diners are truly an invincible business that don't need much to survive. No matter how proactive or forward-thinking a company is in its strategy, certain businesses like diners are just so commoditized that they'll never generate that rapid, spectacular growth. They won't go backwards, but they also won't go up that much. In the big picture, a cheap plate of pancakes, eggs, and bacon is just a cheap plate of pancakes, eggs, and bacon. While the new and exotic draws the crowd, there will always be hunger for the simple, familiar, consistent, and predictable. But in the end, Nostalgia is a fragile currency that will always be worth more in your head than in your stomach.